Welcome to another episode of Better Business, Better Life. I'm your host, Deborah Chantry Taylor. I'm a certified EOS implementer, an FBA accredited family business advisor, and a business owner myself with several business interests. I work with established business owners and their leadership teams to help them live their ideal entrepreneurial life using EOS. EOS is the Entrepreneurial Operating System. The guests on my show come on and they authentically share the highs and lows of creating a successful business and how they turn things around in their business using EOS tools and traction. Or, as it is in this case, they're actually experts who specialize in working with established business owners. The other thing I loved as an agency owner when I would do podcasts is I would be having a conversation with a client and I'd be trying to get them to understand a principle or an idea or just convince them to do something. And often I would say, you know, I had a conversation with insert person's name and they are an expert in this field. I'm going to send you a link. Just listen to the recording when you're in your car, when you're driving to your next meeting. It's 10 minutes. Just listen. I was part of a mastermind group here in the U.S. and we brought in Gino Wickman. And today I am very excited because I'm joined by a lady called Lorraine Ball, who to be fair, I've just met, um, but she is a marketing educator. She's also had a successful exit from a mid-sized digital agency, and I found out that she loves travel and photography. So we've got so much in common, it's not funny. Uh, welcome to the show, Lorraine. Lovely to have you here. Thank you so much, Deborah. It is so nice to be here. Uh, we just had a bit, bit of a chat before we came on the podcast. Obviously, I always do that with my guests and I just, it was such a lot of fun. So I'm looking forward to seeing what we can share with you today. Now, Lorraine, um, as I said in your introduction, you um, had a mid-sized digital agency, which I understand you deliberately built to that size. Can you tell us a little bit about your your story? How did you get to where you are now? Why did you decide to build an agency? Start from the very beginning, if you like. <laughs> so I, whenever anybody asks me about my story, I tell them that in retrospect, it is a well-crafted journey, each step fitting with the other one. And the reality, yeah, not so much. <laughs> <laughs> um, my, uh, my undergrad degree, I was an educator. I actually was an elementary school teacher, realized that me in a room full of children was not a great idea. So I pursued marketing jobs. I ultimately got a uh, a master's in marketing and went to work in corporate. I can honestly say that I loved, loved 18 of the 20 years I spent in corporate. <laughs> <laughs> and at the end, I knew it was time to do something else. And I had this idea for a consulting business, um, left corporate, started this consulting business. I know a lot about marketing. I thought this is great. I can I can provide advice. I can share. I'm not really a graphic designer. I didn't really think of myself as a writer. I was a strategist in corporate. I had people who did that kind of work. So I could just hand off. What I found when you start out and you're referring people, number one, you got to find the right people. And sometimes I did, and sometimes I didn't. You have to give very clear direction. Sometimes I did, and sometimes I didn't. And um, I got frustrated, and so I started bringing more of the work in-house. I started hiring people who I could provide guidance to on a more direct basis to control the outcomes. We started as a traditional agency. This was 2002. You remember that? I remember that before Facebook. Um, yep. Before LinkedIn, I was on Jigsaw and WillieLoman.com and some of those other sites. Um, you know, there were lots of other platforms, but it really wasn't a business marketing tool. And then overnight, it was. And so overnight, we became a digital agency and we developed some really good expertise there. The agency grew. And as you said, 
I made a decision. We got to a place where I started thinking, well, we need to hire another person and sat down with a, a friend who was an advisor who said, do you really? And I said, well, I mean, I, I, I've got all this work. I, I need more people. Will you make more money? And I said, well, actually, no. He said, so you're going to hire another person, expand your management headaches, your administrative hassles. And at the end of the day, you're not going to take home any more money. And I went, ooh, yeah, that's not a good idea. So instead, what we did is we decided how many people do we need to provide the services we wanted to provide. And then whenever we got to capacity, we just raised our price. And we could be more selective about who we had as clients and had a really nice business. And um, in 2021, I had a really nice offer. And I said, you know what? I've done this long enough. I've really done this long enough. It's time to move on. And I let go of the business, but I had already broken off the things that were my intellectual property that did not make sense to sell, the podcast, the online training, some of the other tools that I had created that were really built around my expertise. So when I sold the business, I still had those things and continue to do those. And that's what I do today. I do consulting work. I still podcast and I do some teaching. Yeah, I think that's wonderful. So there's a real deliberateness there in terms of, you know, um, I think Stephen Covey kind of said, start with the end in mind, you know, be really clear about what you want to do. And if you do that, um, not miraculously, but it just happens that you, you can make the right decisions to ensure that you actually get there. So mm -hmm. subconsciously, consciously, you're going, actually, this is the sort of size we want to be, this is what we want to do. And I love the fact that you got really clear about what you wanted to deliver. Um, I think that's often where businesses tend to go wrong is that they, um, especially in the beginning, you know, they'll grab everybody and anybody who'll pay you or do. And then as we get more mature and we employ more staff, we get a little bit more selective, but sometimes you get lost and you start to, you know, go off down tangents and, and do things that really don't add value or don't get you closer to that end goal. So um, really applaud you for having that, that real strong vision and, and even beyond the, the sale, you know, knowing what you wanted to continue with, I think is really important. I'm going to ask you a lot more about marketing in a moment. What I'd like to first of all hear is that, you know, um, Business, as you said, if you look back retrospectively, you can tell beautiful stories about how wonderful it was and how it was all planned and everything worked exactly as I wanted it to. Um, and, you know, in hindsight, it looks a little bit like that, but it's not, it's not all a bit, always a bit of roses, is it? <laughs> no. What were some of the, what were some of the challenges that you faced in that business that you're prepared to share with the listeners? So one of the first things is there was something I was really good at when I was in corporate, which was mm -hmm. building high performance teams. I would, get moved into a department that was, to politely put it, broken <laughs> and dysfunctional. And my job was to lead the team, but, but really to fix it. And on more than one occasion, after I'd been with the team for a while, my boss would pull me aside or a manager would pull me aside and say, you know, if you hadn't fixed it, we'd have shut that whole team down because because it just wasn't working. So that was really a gift. And I thought, well, I, I can teach other managers to, to do this. The problem was um, back in 2002, and I don't know what the economy was like in New Zealand, but in the United States, we were at a place where there were way more people than jobs. It's not like it is today where there are more jobs than people. And so employees were disposable. Companies mm -hmm. thought, well, if you're not happy, there are a hundred people who want your job. And so the idea of me coming in and saying, hey, I can help you build these high performance teams and improve your employee retention, that was a really hard sell. So the, the marketing piece of it, I had this marketing services for smaller businesses. I had these team building services for larger businesses. The mistake was trying to do both. And I did that for about a year and I'd go to a networking event and people would ask me what I did. I couldn't give them a good sound bite because, well, I do this and I do this. And the, those two things weren't even like related, you know, they were completely unrelated. 
And except in my mind, because they both tied to my skill set. And there was that moment where I finally had to step back and go, okay, I need to think about this and I need to figure this out and I need to figure out which of these I was going to do. The mistake was waiting so long. And I know, you know, a year doesn't, year and a half doesn't sound like a lot, but when you're trying to get a business off the ground, that back and forth is a pure distraction. I could have been so much further along, um, had I just figured out, you know what? I can't sell this. I need to move on. Mm-hmm. So um, that that was uh, an interesting process. I eventually called up a friend of mine who was doing team building and was doing it successfully. And I said, hey, I got a present for you. I'm going to send you my whole database. I'm going to send you all my leads. Go forth and have fun. You sell any of these, you buy lunch. She said, cool. <laughs> yep. There was no going back. That was burning the boat. Mm -hmm. And because I had sailed to the island, I had made a commitment. This was what my business was going to be. And um, I uh, couldn't go back because once I gave her the contacts, she was marketing to them. I, I was done. And so it took me too long to get there. But I am glad that I had the courage to finally really let go. Yeah. As I said, I think that's always a bit of a challenge at the beginning. And, and you, you know, you know that by burning the boats, you're actually burning a revenue stream as well, which you kind of go, oh, what am I going to do with that? You know, without that revenue. But actually, I always believe that you have to make space for the right type of clients to work with, whether that is, you know, um, I think that can be product and service based. You know, it's like mm-hmm. actually, if you've got the right price and you've got the right offer and you're doing the right things, then you, if you, you've got to have space to allow those kind of people. And otherwise, you start to, vary what you mm-hmm. offer and vary how you price it and vary the quality of service you deliver in some respects as well. So, yeah. Absolutely. You know, but when it also ta- happens later in business too, though, doesn't it? It's not always when you first start out. I mean, I've got businesses, I've got, you know, hundreds of employees and mm-hmm. they, um, especially with a the vision, they get distracted by a bright, shiny object and mm-hmm. decide to go down that track. Now, sometimes you have to, sometimes you have to pivot, sometimes you have to change as the marketplace changes, but there is a danger of being distracted by things that aren't really part of the core of who you are. I think there is um, two sides to that. I think Mm. there is a point where you completely split your focus or you allow yourself to have a skunk works, a little, a, a little project kind of off here on the side where you don't devote a lot of your attention. You, you give one employee and say, Hey, look, or one team, depending on the size of your organization, we mm-hmm. think this has got potential. I do not want to distract the rest of my team pursuing this, but you go investigate it. You you look into it and you figure out, is there an opportunity? How do we do it? Who's playing there? And then if we start getting some traction, then we'll bring it back to the main organization. And so I think that is how you can explore opportunities without completely yep. losing your focus and keep the innovation alive so a little mini incubator if you like for ideas mm-hmm. to see if they have legs before you kind of throw everything at it yeah i love it you, you know for us um I, I, on and off over the years while i was running the agency i always taught one course a semester at a local university so i had a steady stream of potential interns yeah. and yep. These wonderful, enthusiastic, and totally impractical um, (laughs) college students would come in and they're like, hey, we think this would be great. And I'd be like, you know what? Go try it. It's not going to cost me a lot because I'm not paying you a lot or at times anything to, to be here. And we had some glorious failures and some really successful uh projects. My podcast, more than a few words. I uh, I just finished my fourteenth year. Wow. Started because an intern came to me and said, "You know, you should do this." And I was like, "I I, I don't even know what this is." So you figure it out and tell me what I need to do. And would never be here had I not allowed him to do that. But at the same time, I wasn't taking resources away from clients and projects that we really needed to be focused on. Mm. 
I love it. And that and 14 years, that's, you know, that was probably right at the beginning of when podcasts were happening. I, I find it fascinating because I think we've been going for about, I oh, must be two and a half years now. Um, and, we, and I consistently record at least one or two episodes every week. But there's so many people who get into it, give it a go, do two or three episodes and then give it up. Why, why do you think that is? Because podcasting, sustained podcasting is a lot more work than people realize. They're like, oh, I'll just talk. Yeah. Well, you know what? <laughs> that's that's not really enough. You need to um you need to be prepared to do it regularly. And you know, having um a podcast every week, you've got to have content, you have to have guests, you have to have people that are are interesting to talk to, and you have to have that steady stream. And mm-hmm. People don't realize that after they run through the first 10 guests, the friends and family, <laughs> friends and family, that, that that it's a lot to keep it going. So I always tell people if they think they're going to have a podcast that before you launch, you need to have five to 10 episodes in the can and you need to have a list of 20, 10 15, 20, depending on how many episodes a week you're going to do, guess that you think are going to be good candidates going forward. Yeah. And I don't know if you, I mean, we try to be really, really consistent as in a podcast every single week without fail, sometimes too, uh, which means also that, you know, if you're thinking about taking a break, I just took three weeks off in Bali, you've actually got to make sure that you've got all that content kind of lined up as well so that it can continue even if you're not actually physically there. So it, you're right, it is. there's a lot more work involved mm-hmm. pre the podcast, even, you know, I mean, I, I'm really reasonably lucky I can usually wing it in a podcast, but you've got to prepare, you know, knowing who your guest is, knowing what you're going to be talking about. And then there's all the post edit stuff, which I don't do. I'm sure you don't do. The team does it, but it's still, um, there's still work there that either you've got to do or you've got to pay somebody to do as well. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And a lot of people don't realize, well, they don't realize how much work it really takes. And there's also, there's a lot of crappy podcasts out there. (laughs) there. There are a lot of podcasts that people don't take the time and editing doesn't have to be a lot, but clean it up a little bit. Make Mm -hmm. sure you've got a good microphone. Make sure if you're doing video that it's something somebody wants to look at. You know, it it, a little bit of attention. And just like in any kind of marketing, sometimes that's more than people want to put into it. Yeah. I must admit, I'm a bit excited. I've actually got a, a session with a podcast expert this afternoon who's actually going to take me through live on a podcast and show me where our podcast is doing well, where it could be doing better. Um, and, I, and I'm really excited by that because, I mean, I, I love getting that kind of feedback. It's really helpful. But from a marketing perspective, what is the point of podcasting? Like, why, what, why do you do it? What do you see it adds as value to a business so, or a person? As, oh, it, it definitely does. And especially right now, I don't want to go down the AI rabbit hole, but I am just for a moment. With the advent of AI, the internet is flooded with mediocre, generic content. And so as a marketer, as a business, if you want to stand out, you have got to have good original content that you're putting out there. And What's wonderful about a podcast is it is this conversation is unique and one of a kind. Even even if we're talking about things that you talk about every week on your show, our conversation is unique. It is one of a kind. And as a result, you have video, you have audio, and if you're smart, you have a transcript that you can then turn into blog posts, turn into social media shares, share the whole video, share snippets. Suddenly you've got this wealth of Mm. reusable content. So that's number one. Number two, podcasting establishes you as an expert in your field. Even as you're inviting on guests who know more about a niche than you do, and you're the one asking questions, that conversation raises your credibility in the eyes of your audience, either because you know the questions to ask, you're asking the questions they want to ask, and you are connected enough to have these amazing people come and talk to you. 
And so the podcast establishes your credibility. The other thing I loved as an agency owner when I would do podcasts is I would be having a conversation with a client and I'd be trying to get them to understand a principle or an idea or just convince them to do something. And often I would say, you know, I had a conversation with insert person's name and they are an expert in this field. I'm going to send you a link. Just listen to the recording when you're in your car, when you're driving to your next meeting. It's 10 minutes, just listen. And so I had the advantage of what I would call that third party expert telling them exactly what I would have told them, but now it has more credibility because it's not me. Yeah. I must admit, I've done that with my, I had, um, I've got a couple of, you know, amazing people who've done podcasts. I've been very fortunate to get some really super people, yourself included, who've shared things about all kinds of business, all, all parts of the business, I should say, which means like I've actually said to people, hey, look, if you're having a challenge with a, pe a, a people challenge, go and listen to this podcast with mm -hmm. Tony Falkenstein. He talks about what you can do with that. Or if you're having a challenge with this, go and listen to this. And, and it is, it's really, really helpful to do that. The other benefit I got from it personally, or get from it personally, is also the ability for me to continue my learning journey as well. Oh, yeah. Every time I meet with a guest, I'm kind of going, oh yeah, uh, it's either a reminder or it's a, um, something completely new. And it's like, it's I, I love that part of it. Absolutely. I, especially last year when, when as AI was exploding and people were trying to figure out how to use it and use it effectively in their marketing. And I was experimenting, but I had a couple people on who were just this much ahead of me on the learning curve and listening to their experiences and taking their suggestions and trying it. It was great. It was fabulous. And um, it was really a great way to get up to speed on something in real time as it was changing. Yeah, I was the same. I actually must admit, I was very hesitant about AI in the mm -hmm. beginning. I, I I think it's because of the media, what we read. And it was like, oh, it's going to take over the world. They're going to have robots everywhere. And then I had a couple of experts on it. It was like, oh, my goodness, this this thing is actually so powerful. It mm -hmm. can go horribly wrong. And mm -hmm. it's not always the right solution. But used effectively, it is brilliant. Yeah. Uh, absolutely. I am. Um... I'm teaching marketing right now at a university and I, I tell my students at the beginning of the course, I'm not going to tell you not to use AI, but I am going to tell you to use it well, because if you don't use it well, what, I, what you're going to get is generic boring content that doesn't answer my question. And when I get a generic boring paper that doesn't answer my question, you get an F. <laughs> and, um, uh, I had a couple of students who, who tested me on it and you can still tell if you don't take the time to rewrite and mm. really double check what you're getting and you just copy and paste from AI, it's not really good. No. Um, yeah, and I, I must admit, uh, yeah, just talking about chat GPT, which is what most people know, you can put stuff in there and you say, um, you know, I want to be casual and professional. I tried this the other day. And honestly, it had, it was like a college student kind of like, yo, um, <laughs> I was like, that's, that's neither, that, that's sure it's casual. I get that, but it's certainly not professional. And it just wasn't language I would ever use. It's like, no, I, 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 but it does. It does help you to get started, I think, mm -hmm. sometimes, mm -hmm. um, or it helps you to condense things down. So I'm very verbose, and it's really helpful to actually bring that down to a, a more succinct thing, and then I and then I put it back into my own words. <laughs> Absolutely. Well, I, I I'll tell you what I um, maybe three months ago I started uploading the transcripts for my mm. episodes, and I just said write a three paragraph summary. Write it in the first person from me. And I typically yep. say, I say, use a conversational, uh, but professional. Good. Don't use casual because that, no. um, that voice, um, I describe it as the bro voice. It sounds like yeah. it's being written by a frat boy, not just a college it's... student, but it's a frat boy. And I'm like, no, there is nothing <laughs> about this that says frat boy. Oh my gosh, yeah, that's a pearl. I, I absolutely agree. Okay, conversational. So that, there's my, my well, not more than one nugget, but that's my nugget for the day. I'm going to take away and give it a go. Um, let's get back to just marketing in general now. So we've talked a little bit about AI. We've talked a little bit about, you know, podcasting, what that can do. Um, but for, 
even some of my larger businesses that I work with, often they've not dedicated time to market. They've always got salespeople. Salespeople mm-hmm. are kind of a given. And then marketing is kind of seen like the fluffy colored crayon mm-hmm. department. We don't need that. You know, brand is considered to be a logo. And it's like, we've got a logo. It's like, yeah, but do you have an actual brand? That's not that, that's not the same. So if people haven't even really considered marketing and they're brushing it off as, oh, we don't need it. It doesn't work. What would you say would be the first steps for them to consider? So, wow, um, it is so depressing that in this day and age, people still say things like that, and they do. Um, they do. To me, marketing and sales work hand in hand. When you have a good marketing program, you will deliver better leads to your salespeople. Um, but not only will you deliver better leads to your salespeople because you're driving the right people to your business, when the salespeople have the conversations, if you have good marketing, you have good follow-up material. Like you were talking about when somebody has a problem with HR and you send them as a natural course of a video or an audio recording that helps fill in the blanks. So um, good marketing at its core the number one thing marketing needs to do is answer a very important question. There are a million people out there that do what you do. Why should I buy from you? And to answer that question, you need to get very clear on who your customer is. You need to get very clear on what they want, not what you want to sell, but what they're looking for. And then how do you deliver that? And when you craft that into a position statement that really clarifies that, everything else gets easy. Now, every ad, every marketing strategy gets evaluated against that. Oh, we should be on TikTok. Really? Mm -hmm. You said you're your target customers are 50 years old and older. Do you really need to be on TikTok? We need to have a great big retail outlet. Really? Your consumers are Gen Z. They ain't leaving their houses. They're working from home. Couldn't we just build an e-commerce site? I mean, and it's not a one size fits all. It really is. Who is your customer now? What do they need to know about me to believe that I can solve their problem? How do I present it? Where do I present it? And when you do those things well, now the people that call that fill out a form on your website are the right people. Have we got time for a funny story? Oh, please. Yes. Okay. So, and this actually goes back to my corporate days. And this is in the early days of the internet and companies were just starting internet promotions. And my boss came to me and he said, okay, we have a brand new website. We want people to come to the website. We want them to give us their contact information and we want them to look at different pages on the site. Okay. Site visits, page views, contact info. Got it. We put together this massive contest, fabulous game where you came and you entered and you had to answer a trivia question. And the answer was actually somewhere on the website. So you had to spend time and we had fabulous prizes. If you, you know, you got the question right, you'd advance to the next level. And it was like a month long promotion. If you could imagine, um, this was a big company. Our basketball team, we had just built a brand new stadium. My company was actually the title sponsor at the stadium. So when you came into the game, imagine a a soccer or rugby match professional, how many people Mm -hmm. are coming in. We had a row of computer terminals. You could enter right there. We collected thousands and thousands and thousands of names. How much insurance did we sell? Yeah, that would be none. Why? Because at that time, who was playing games online? Who were entering contests? Young men. 
18 to 25. Who is our average customer? A 55-year-old woman. <laughs> yeah. And I was like, you didn't say you wanted sales. You said you wanted traffic, page views. I said, well, the good news is um, we can keep all that contact info. And 30 years from now, they're going to be married to our target customers. <laughs> oh, my goodness. That is hilarious. I mean, I've got, I've, yeah. It it's it happens regularly, right? It sort mm -hmm. of it, it comes down to being really clear about what the what success looks like. What are the mm -hmm. outcomes you actually want, and then mm -hmm. and then you can develop the campaign for the right people. And mm -hmm. I think people get you know. I always find because in EOS we actually do talk about who is your ideal customer. We're not mm -hmm. saying every customer you're ever going to have, but who is the ideal customer? What they look like, and it's sometimes really hard for people. That, but they say, but we we can we can serve this person. We can serve this person. Yeah, but actually, who is the easiest customer who is the customer like mm -hmm. you said 55 year old women buy insurance that's mm -hmm. the customer that you should be aiming for and then you need mm -hmm. to talk to them in a language that appeals to them use um channels tools mm -hmm. that appeal to them yeah absolutely <laughs> you know we um uh we actually were uh an eos company it, uh oh. back at, by the agency we we use the eos model and one of the kind of things that came out of that whole process as we were trying to identify our target customers is we would do an exercise that I just loved. We'd sit at a table, you know, 10 people in the agency. And the question was, if we could only work with three clients, which three would you pick? Mm -hmm. And everybody picked their favorites. And we talked about what did they have in yeah. common? Why did we like working with them? And mm -hmm. so how do we get more of them? Don't even worry about defining a niche. What is it about, you know, the flooring company, the bean company, and the heating and air conditioning company? What do they really have in common? Was it the services we provided? Was it the relationship? And that helped us. And then we did the other side of it. If we had to fire a company, uh. we don't have the capacity. Who do we fire? And that led to some really interesting and lively conversations about the clients that were bad fits. And also one of the times we had this situation where everybody in the company said, fire uh, Mary, uh, the Mary school. And one woman who was my web designer said, really? You guys would get rid of Mary? I like working with Mary. Okay, here's the deal. Raven, you now have, you are now point of contact for that client. You like working with them. You're going to be their account rep. I know that you don't normally account rep, but you got a relationship with them. It was a development thing for her. It helped us maintain the client who was profitable and it protected mm -hmm. everybody else in the organization from the crazy. <laughs> Love it. <laughs> okay, so I had no idea that you ran on EOS, so that's sort of a little bit of a, a thing I should have asked beforehand, I suppose. Um, I I work with advertising agencies quite a lot with EOS. I think it's a great structure for them to oh, use because I think it gives them a frame. I mean, it's not, it doesn't tell you what to do, but it gives you a framework mm -hmm. to have that focus, that accountability, that mm -hmm. discipline. Sometimes when I talk to agencies in the beginning, they're going to go, oh, but we're creative and it's going to take away all our creativity. Um, how would you answer that given that you've used it in your creative agency? So I, you know what I would do? I would actually um, ask them about brand standards. Put it in language that they understand. Any marketing company worth their salt knows that a brand standard, good brand standards, colors, fonts are not limiting. They give you the guide rails within which you can be creative. And I would say the same thing about EOS, that it gives you guide rails. It doesn't, it doesn't change your business. It doesn't change your creative output. It gives you guide rails to play within, and it also helps you have those planning sessions and conversations about the business, take the operational hassles out of the way, and now your meetings become about the creative process. When you're not spending every meeting 
going over and going over and going over the same things that aren't working. It it mm -hmm. actually separates those two. So you have two different conversations. You have the operational conversations and you have the creative conversations. We loved it. And actually, um, I got introduced to it. I was part of a mastermind group here in the U.S. And we brought in Gino Wickman. Oh, Gino. Wow. I, and, and he, <laughs> yeah. and he spoke and after this, and we brought him in because one of the agencies was already an EOS agency. By the time he left and we came back together again, six months later, I would say about half of us had switched to an, or were implementing some portion of an EOS model. Yeah. I mean, Gino is amazing. I've had, I've been very privileged to meet him a couple of times. And obviously he, he's not the owner of EOS anymore, but he's the mm -hmm. guy who came up with the entire concept many, many years ago. Um, I love the, I mean, he can describe it better than anybody else's. It's his baby, but you know, he talks about the fact that we're not going to change your business does what it does. We assume mm -hmm. it's profitable. We assume that it kind of, you know, mm -hmm. who your target, you know what you're doing. Um, uh, we're just there to, as you said, provide those guide rails to give you more clarity, to give you more focus, to give you more accountability. So you've got the vision that traction working together perfectly and therefore uh, the business just gets better and better and better yeah absolutely it, there were two things you know I talked about the two mistakes that I made you know or the mistakes that I made early in my business there were two really good decisions I made um, the mm -hmm. first was to to get some sales training I'm a marketer I did not think of myself as a salesperson and learning how to have high quality sales conversations, learning how to apply what I knew about consumer behavior and decision making into those sales conversations was invaluable. And then the second thing was implementing EOS as a part of how we operated and lived every day. I'm really pleased to hear that. And, and again, I, I would reiterate that. I think that the sales thing, just because you're a marketer, um, sales doesn't necessarily come easy. And I think that, again, if you do some sales training, they give you a framework. They give you mm -hmm. some some guide rails. They, they help you to understand how to better do that. So I wholeheartedly agree with you. Okay. Um, we could no doubt talk for hours because there's so much we have to, um, in you know, both in common but also um, are passionate about. But tell me. I'd always like to ask our guests for three kind of top tips, tools, strategies that they can actually take away, hopefully put into practice straight away that will help with their business. What would be, I mean, you've given us so much stuff already, but what would be the three key things you would say? I would say that first and foremost, um, you've got to remember that the tools change, but the principles of good marketing don't. I have been doing this for a very long time. I have seen a lot of tools come and go. But no matter what rolls out, the questions are always the same. Is this a good fit for my customer? Is this going to help me deliver my message in a way that represents me well, adds to my credibility, and answers my customer's questions? So mm -hmm. not, you know, number one, remember that no matter what, you know, this, this month it's TikTok, you know, it, it, it was Facebook, it was Instagram, it, you know, it, there was a time when it was TV, whatever it is, yep. that's all secondary. The primary is who is your customer and what do you do for them? What do you want them to know about you? The second thing, and this is not just marketing, I think it's business in general and it ties to um, EOS, but I, I think even if you are not running an EOS business, it is about the process. It is about documenting your processes. If at some point down the road you want to sell your business, the ability for that business to run without you without any of your key managers will rely on the process. So it is not too early to start documenting what you're doing. It is never too early to uh, look at it and take that time to step back and go, you know what? This is how we do this. We've done it this way for three years, for five years, for a week and a half, whatever it is. Does it make sense are there too many steps? Are there gaps? 
and cleaning up, cleaning up the process, um, especially with marketing. That process should include not only the content creation and getting the, the, the marketing out there, but it has to include the metrics on the back end, measuring what you've done and figuring out what do you need to change for the next time. Yep. And um, the third thing. Wow, there's so many. I think even, I think your marketing needs to be fun. I think there needs to be a humanity. Even if you are a very, very professional accounting law firm, there needs to be a little humor or just a little bit of warmth. Um, we did marketing for several years for a funeral home. Now, we didn't do it funny, but we did warm and personal. And um, they are, you know, they're very successful. This is not an inexpensive product. You know, you have, you have to be able to think about it as a product. But there was just something very warm about how that company was perceived and it was very much a reflection of of the owner that drew people to them that made people comfortable with the choice to use them rather than a dozen other funeral homes in town hmm. i think you're absolutely right and i mean yeah maybe fun's not the right word but it does have to kind of we People like doing business with people. So there has to be a human element to it. And, you know, whether you've got a small business, a medium size, a large business, there is still a personality mm -hmm. that generally comes from the founder, but that, that needs to, to shine through. Mm -hmm. um, we're not dealing with robots. We're not dealing with AI. We're dealing with actual human beings who, who enjoy the, the warmth that comes with being with other human beings. So, yeah. So just to repeat those back. So the, the first one is like, know your customer. Know absolutely your customer. And one of the, the tips and tools you gave us earlier is, you know, think Think about the three customers that you love to work with and why and what it is that you love about them. And also think about those that you would fire and what you would do. And then when you've got that really clear, make sure you've got the right tools, the right you're using the right channels, you're speaking the right language for them. Process, I love that you bring that up. It's been, it's been a, a, a little bit of a challenge for me over the years because I thought I didn't like process, but actually mm -hmm. it's because we were overcomplicating it. And mm -hmm. as you said, if you don't have processes, you cannot sell your business. Your business relies on you. There is nothing to sell. And the third is very much about, um, yeah, you bring some personality, some warmth, some human into your um, messaging, into your marketing. Brilliant. Okay, there's a whole bunch of other stuff that I've written down that I'm going to probably put in the notes as well. But, you know, so just things around, you know, if you're thinking about why, why do I need to do marketing? We've got sales, we don't need it. Remember that marketing leads to better leads. It gives you better content to share. It, it drives people down that funnel, the sales funnel. So do keep that in mind. And I'm never going to forget, do not ask for casual in chat GPT. <laughs> otherwise, you'll get frat boy and <laughs> go for conversational. <laughs> That's brilliant. Uh, um, been an absolute pleasure to talk to you, Lorraine. I want to now ask you if people do want to work with you. You've mentioned you've got a podcast, obviously, more than a few words. You've got some online training. You obviously do a lot of educating. If people want to work with you, who do you love to work with? Where do they find you? So um, I love working with business owners who I do love startups. I think that's a fun process. But I really love business owners that feel that they're at a tipping point. They're ready to take their marketing to the next level. They're ready to take their business to the next level. And maybe they don't even know what they don't know. And they're looking to have a conversation about either the marketing in general, maybe have someone who has no skin in the game, look at their website, look at their social media and give them some feedback and some, some ideas on how to improve. And so I love spending um, what I call office hours. And it's just a great way to realign kind of what you're thinking you need to be doing in your business. And um, if people want to have an office hour session, if they are looking to get in touch with me, two places. I'm on LinkedIn. If you search Lorraine Ball, yes, there are other Lorraine Balls in the world. They all have my name, whatever. Um, <laughs> but I'm active enough on LinkedIn, you'll find me. Um, and then the other places, if you go to more than a few words.com, 
You'll see a link to my toolbox. You'll see a link to office hours. You'll see lots of episodes and conversations. Yeah, that's one said more than a few words dot com. And mm-hmm. of course, on LinkedIn, which um, hopefully most people listening to this love the power of LinkedIn and what it can oh, do for us. <laughs> Hey, look, I've really, really enjoyed talking to you um, this morning for me, this afternoon for you. Thank you so much for your time. Um, We'll continue this conversation offline and, and no doubt keep in contact, but thank you. I appreciate it. Deborah, thank you. This was wonderful. Thank you very much. Thanks for listening to Better Business, Better Life. If you want more information or want to get in contact about using EOS in your business, you can visit my website at debra.coach. That's www.debra.coach. From there, you can also download a free ebook, Six Secrets to Get It Up on Your Business. Thanks again for listening.